Well, good morning and welcome back to Sunday School here at Hickory Grove. Glad to have you join us as we continue our study through the Gospel Project. Now, we are nearing the end of this three-year study. In fact, today marks the beginning of the end. These next four weeks, we will study together the final word of God to us as recorded in the book of the Revelation. This morning, we'll be in Revelation 1, and so I invite you to take your Bible and turn with me, with me there, if you will. We'll study today, Revelation 1. Next Sunday, we'll look at the third chapter. Uh, in a couple weeks, we'll look at the fifth chapter. And then our final week of this three-year study through the Gospel Project, we'll look at the final three chapters of the Bible, Revelation 19, 20, and 21. But today, Revelation 1. It's long. I'm going to spare you from reading it, but I encourage you to maybe press pause now and read all verses, verses 1 through 20. We're going to take a look, at least a high-level look, at all 20 verses this morning. So you read those verses and then join me as we pray. Father in heaven, I ask now that you would come and that you would minister your word to your people and that you would use me in spite of me as a means to that end, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, the book of the Revelation, it's at one and the same time a fascinating and frustrating book. It's fascinating because, my word, if you've read it, you know it's, in a very real sense, stranger than fiction. I mean, this is a book that has some wild, wild things occur. It's a book that you just can't help but wonder, my word, how is this all going to actually turn out? It's, it's just fascinating. The problem is it's at the same time frustrating because it's talking about things that haven't occurred yet. It's all about the future, and it tends to describe those things that will soon take place in symbolic language. And the tricky thing about symbolism is it's all too often enigmatic. It's difficult to understand. This book, in other words, is notoriously difficult to interpret. So what I want to do this morning is not suggest to you that I have the, the secret decoder. I've got the key to make sure my interpretation is the exact most faithful one. What I want to simply commend to you today, that despite all the enigmatic things this book talks about regarding the future, there is but one thing it talks about more than any other. The book of the Revelation, in a very real sense, unveils in all of his glory Jesus Christ. He is the theme of the book, and he is the theme of the Bible, and he is that which the book of the Revelation unveils. Revelation refer is a, a, a book that's described as an apocalyptic book, and that word, apocalypte, apocalypsis, that word literally means unveiling. And what this book is doing is it's unveiling in a fuller sense Jesus in his resurrected glory. And so today, I want you to see with me this wonderful, strengthening truth. And that truth is that we will one day see His glory. We will see in full what we now see in part. And that is the hope we as believers have. We who live by faith and not by sight have hope that one day we will see in full what we are now believing by faith. We will see his glory. And in the first chapter of the Revelation, there are three aspects of Christ's glory, in my judgment, that he begins to unveil. And you'll see a whole lot more of this as we go throughout the rest of the book over the next few weeks together. So if you're taking notes, mark these down. First off, I want you to see the glory of Jesus' victory. And we see this beginning in verse 1 all the way down to verse 8. What I invite you to do is skip with me down to verse 5. I want to point out just a few things about the victory Jesus brings, beginning in verse 5. He says that this is from Jesus Christ. This message is from Jesus Christ, who he calls the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead. He is the ruler of kings on earth. What's happening in this verse is we are seeing Jesus' victory over death. 
When Jesus is described as the firstborn of the dead, Jesus is the resurrected one. He is the one that God declared sinless. He paid the price of sin and God raised him from the dead and he is alive. He is no longer dead. He had victory over death. And one day, we who know this doctrinally, who, we who know this in part, we will see this Jesus resurrected. He will be alive in bodily form and we will say our faith was vindicated. We whom we trusted, he did what he said he did. He is alive. See with me now the glory of his victory over death. Notice in the latter half of verse 5, there is another aspect to this victory. He didn't simply have victory over death. He had victory over sin, the cause of death. Look, if you will, at the latter half of verse 5. It says, To him who loves us and freed us from our sins by his blood. This Jesus did what no other man could. By his death, he freed us from our sins. By his resurrection, he freed us from our sins. Jesus made it possible for us to escape the curse of death. Jesus fulfilled all of God's righteous demands. Jesus absorbed the wrath of God. The biblical word is propitiation. He took all the wrath of God away. And so now we who trust him, who are united to him by faith, we stand justified. We stand forgiven. We stand not condemned. And that's thanks to Jesus's victory over sin. He broke the power of sin. He stands as the one who freed us, as it were, from it. And so, praise be to God, we will one day see in full this Jesus standing in victory over death and over sin itself. But lastly, I want you to see in verse 7, there is a third layer to this victory Jesus brings. And praise be to God, this victory, as we see in verse 7, is a victory over any and all rebellion. For look in verse 7, it says, Behold, he's coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. In other words, Jesus is going to stand in victory one day, and all those who claimed him to be a fraud, all those who claimed him to be a liar or a lunatic will one day declare him to be Lord. Every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus is who he says he is, so Paul says in the book of Philippians. And so praise be to God, we see that one day all who pierced him will wail on account of him. The reason that is good news is because it gives us the great assurance that Jesus is Lord over everything. Jesus has sovereign rule over all things, and his victory will be full and final. Our faith will be vindicated. Praise be to God. One day we will see his glory, the glory of his victory over death, over sin, and over all rebellion. That's the first thing I want you to see, but notice with me a second aspect of Jesus' glory we will behold one day. Number two, mark this down, we will see the glory not only of his victory, we will see the glory of his majesty, which we see in verses 9, well really all the way down to verse 16. So I want to show you several aspects of Jesus' majesty unveiled in these verses. First off, I want you to notice with me the majesty of his kingship. Look, if you will, at verse 13. It starts to describe this Jesus, and it says this Jesus is in, the, is in the midst of the lampstands, one like a son of man clothed with a long robe. When it refers to this son of man clothed in a long robe, this is picturing regal, royal robes. This is picturing royalty, and it is inferring for us Jesus in his kingship, Jesus in his royal reign. Jesus will have full sovereign authority over all things one day when we see him in full resurrected glory for all eternity. I should say he, he enjoys that this moment. He is reigning, but we will see him in his full majesty of his kingship. But notice there's another article of clothing he wears. It doesn't just say his long robe. It also says a golden sash. And this refers not just merely to the majesty of his kingship. It refers to the majesty 
of his priesthood. For that golden sash, which should have drawn to the minds of the original readers of this text, the, the sash that would cover a priest. And remember, a priest is one who comes between God and man, which is why, by the way, I, nor Clint, nor any other pastor here is called a priest. We're called pastors because that word literally means a shepherd. We are no different from you. A priest in the, Old, uh, in the Old Testament was one who came between God and man. He was the one that would mediate. But we don't need a priest to mediate between us anymore. Jesus is our great high priest. He is the one who mediates between God the Father and we sinners. And praise be to God, he is a perfect high priest. He is one who will cover all our sins. And so we should... Rejoice in the majesty of his priesthood, for there will come a day where we stand before God's great throne of judgment, and Jesus will be our priest. He will be our advocate. He will be the one who stands between us and God, and God will forgive us. He will bring us into his everlasting paradise thanks to Jesus and Jesus alone. So one day, my friends, we're going to see his majesty, the glory of his majesty, the majesty of his kingship, the majesty of his priesthood, Notice with me more, you're going to notice the majesty of his holiness. Look at how it describes him next in verse 14. It says, The hairs of his head, they were white, white like wool, like snow. Now that word white, using that, uh, that very visual language, it should draw our minds to the perfection of holiness or purity. Jesus is utterly holy. He is without blemish. He is perfect in holiness. And one day we will behold him in his perfect holiness. We haven't done that yet. Every instance of man seeing God in the Bible, they fall over as if dead. They can barely withstand it. Moses beheld God in his Shekinah glory, and it radically changed his person. One day we are going to behold the majesty of his holiness, this son of man whose hair is white, like white wool, like snow. That's the fourth, the third thing I should say I want you to notice. Notice with me a fourth element of his majesty. We're going to behold the majesty of his omniscience, which means all-knowing, his wisdom, his ability to perceive and see all things, which we see in the latter half of verse 14, where he says, his eyes were like a flame of fire. His eyes are all penetrating. He will come one day and he will see all things. He will know all things. Indeed, he knows you this moment. He knows every hair on your head, every thought in your heart. He knows every dark crevice recess of your soul. He knows you. His eyes are like a flaming fire. They are searching. They know. And one day we will see the majesty of his all-knowing omniscience. We will stand before this God and he will be in every essence God. He'll know all things. That's the fourth element of his majesty. Let's notice a fifth element of his majesty. Fifthly, I want you to see the majesty of his justice. You, this might be a little lost on you, but look with me, if you will, at verse 15. It says, his feet, they were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace. This is picturing the Son of Man seated and you are noticing his feet in this burnished bronze, which is referring to justice and the law. And they are refined in a furnace, which means they are perfect. They are without blemish. They are totally righteous and just. And we will stand before God and experience the full totality of righteousness and justice. There will be nothing that we could call unfair, nothing that we could call unright, anything that we could look at and say, oh God, you're wrong on this, we will stand before him in all of his majesty and we will cry out, sweet justice. This is God who defines good and wrong, good and evil. This is God who is going to define perfect justice. Behold with me the glory of his majesty, the majesty of his justice. And lastly, notice with me the majesty of of his message, or you could say the majesty of his prophecy. For look, if you will, at verse 16, where it says, In his right hand he held seven stars, and from his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. That two-edged sword should draw our mind to the Bible, which is referred to as a two-edged sword. And out of Jesus' mouth proceeds this gospel message, this word that is perfect and cutting 
And there is a majesty to this message. This message can do what my tongue cannot, convert the hearts of men. This message is the power of God unto salvation. And one day we will see in full that every word that proceeded from his mouth was true, reliable, trustworthy, worthy of our lives. We will stand vindicated before his throne and we will fall down and worship him in his majesty. The majesty of his kingship, of his priesthood, of his holiness, of his omniscience, of his justice, and indeed of his prophecy or of his message. Praise be to God for the majesty of Jesus. That's the second main thing I want you to see. One day we are going to see him in all his glory, the glory of his victory, the glory of his majesty. And let's bring it all together and conclude our time today with one third and final overarching element of his glory that we will one day behold. Number three, and finally, I want you to see with me not just the glory of his victory and of his majesty, but notice with me the glory of his authority, which we see beginning in verse 17 and following. Three elements of his overarching authority over all things that we will one day experience in full. First, I want you to notice his authority over time which you'll notice in verse 17. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me and he said, fear not. And notice what he says of himself. I am the first and I am the last. This is him referring to his eternality. He came before all things and he will be at the end of all things. He is the eternal God. He is the uncaused cause, the unmoved mover. He is the one, he is the first subject of the Bible. In the beginning, subject, God, created, verb. God did something which caused everything else in the Bible to happen. God is God. Praise be to him that he has authority over time, which is gives us hope when we see all these phrases about him coming soon and we realize, well, it's been 2,000 years since he said that. And what sense is soon? And we can take hope that with God, a day is like a 1,000 years, a 1,000 years is like a day, that in God's economy, what seems long to us is but a vapor, but a whisper, but a snap of the fingers to him. He is coming soon. He will one day come as sure as the sun will rise from the east and set in the west. So too we can trust that he is coming and he is, has all authority over time. Moreover, I want you to notice that he has authority over life itself. Notice, if you will, verse 18. He says, I am the living one. I died, and behold, I'm alive forevermore. This is Jesus reminding us that he has authority over life itself. He is alive. He is living forevermore. He is the one who defines what it means to have eternal life. Jesus is alive. Authority over life and conversely authority over death. For he says, I was dead, but now I'm alive forevermore. Jesus conquered death. Death could not hold him. The grave could not hold him. He's alive. He is reigning. And he has authority not just over life and death. He has authority over eternity itself. For he says, I hold in my hands the keys of death and Hades. Jesus is in essence saying, I have control over everything. I have control over eternal damnation, eternal glory. All things that will one day transpire are in my sovereign grip. I have full authority over these things. And lastly, just as a passing notice, I want you to see in verses 19 and 20, we see also his authority over the church itself. For notice, he says, he describes all this enigmatic language as the churches. Let me read for you verse 20. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands and the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Very briefly, this is reminding us that Jesus' sovereignty is in the midst of his church. This church, all Christians gathered in all places who are worshiping the Lamb, he has utter and complete sovereign control over them, which is why our church here at Hickory Grove has as its leader Jesus Christ himself, who is the cornerstone of this church, who is the head of this church, who is the one who sovereignly controls it, which is why we don't have a pope 
It's why we don't have a bishop. It's why we are servant-led by shepherds, pastors, and we submit ourselves to the authority of this word, which is how Jesus has spoken to us. This is the authority, not my words or any pastor's words, this word itself. And so I beg you, as you study this book of the Revelation these next few weeks, give yourself to the authority of this book. Trust this word and take hope that this book is not some decoder ring to help you figure out all the ways the future is going to unfurl. There are some significant pointers, of course, but this book is ultimately about Jesus, the Son of Man, whom we will one day see in full glory. We'll see the glory, my friends. We're going to see the glory of his victory. We're going to see the glory of his majesty. And thanks be to God, we will one day see the glory of his authority. One day every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. I look forward to that day when you and I will join that chorus and exalt in Jesus in all his resplendent glory. Would you join me as we pray? Father in heaven, I ask that you would come and seal this word to your people's hearts. Do this, I pray, for the sake of the name of Jesus Christ, the name above all names.